Well, you have two historical novels about China. Is that right? One historical. The other one was actually contemporaries I could make it. Oh, okay. So Drink Team Tea House was set in – I wrote in 98. It was set in 97. So um, – and then I went to historical. And now that you're living in Hong Kong, you've written about – I, you know, I write about places I'm not in. Um, <laughs> so now I'm in Hong Kong, I'm, uh, I'm writing about England. Um, so I think nostalgia for a place must be something that kind of excites me or gets me to write. Yeah, it's not even really England, though, is it? It's Anglo-Saxon England. It's a pretty different place. Yeah, in, in the book I, I use the Anglo-Saxon names. And, and one of the reasons I did that was because I wanted to... So it didn't feel like England, because although the geography is the same, actually it is quite a different country. Um, and if I was talking, say, about Nottingham, um, you know, or Manchester, I didn't want you to think of Manchester or Nottingham, or even Manchester United. Um, I wanted you to think of these are, these are kind of strange places. Um, yeah, it is a foreign world, the past is, you know, a foreign country. Can you actually pronounce the names of... Like, London is not London. London is... Yeah, Londonburg. Um, and most of them are actually fairly similar. Um, Contone, Londonburg. You know, some of them almost exact, exactly the same, like Winchester. Um, I mean, it's interesting because in this period, England is slightly different. The capital is not London, even though London is the biggest city. Um, so, yeah. I think, I think you'd better start with an outline of the story. Well, originally, I was looking at doing a novel about 1066, and for those of you who don't know, 1066 is the year, the last year, or last time England was conquered, um, and uh, they're conquered by the Norman French who come over, um, and the Battle of Hastings, and the King of England, a man called Harold, gets an arrow in his eye, um, and that's, that's kind of... Um, that's the end of kind of England's links with the Germanic world, and it kind of gets pulled towards sort of southern Europe. Um, looking at that story, I realized actually 50 years before that, in 1016, there's another, another conquest, you know, the, the sort of second to last time England was conquered, which is the Danish conquest, which is an Englishman I'd never really heard about. Um, and so, and, and the interesting thing, I guess, is the the father of the man who gets the arrow in his eye is, is very um, caught up in these events. And he rises to power from being a, a kind of nobody, really, to being the most powerful man in the kingdom. Um, and so I thought, well, to tell the story of 1066, I want to go back and tell the story of his father um, and, and what happened in the kind of the Danish conquest um, 50 years before that. So that's what this, this book is about, um, is telling that story. There's great names. Wolf Noth, is that God's Yeah, father? I mean, you can see the kind of changes that happen in England after this period because, you know, we have, um, you know, Wolf Noth um, means um, kind of fighting wolf. And so you have these fabulous names that we don't have in English anymore because we have names like William and Henry, um, which are all French names. And that's because of the Battle of Hastings. Whereas in Germany, you still have them, um, you know, Wolfgang... Amadeus Mozart. You know, I met a guy from um, Norway last week called Thor, who's the, the Norwegian god of thunder. He has a big red beard and um, a big hammer. And I thought, well, what a, such a better name than Justin, even. You know, Justin? Um, I kind of like these old Germanic names. Yeah, Ethelred. I'm, I'm partial to Ethelred. Yeah. I like Ethelred. It's a good name. Yeah, I had a son born four months ago, and I named him Edmund, which is a, a very good old English um, king's name. Um, which not, is Eth not Ethelred. Not Ethelred, no. No, that's no. probably a bit cruel. Yeah, I'm exactly. Yeah. Um, why, don't you, why don't you read a bit? I think it's hard to get the feeling. We, we have the, the sound effects, as you've noticed next door. There's a lot of sort of banging in Anglo-Saxon England. Yeah, I think uh, the just, Vikings are at the door. Yeah, right, and they're sort of burning something down and cleaving people with battle axes. So that, that, that'll give you uh, some additional flavor of the book. So hopefully they'll start on cue and start banging again. Um, go, one thing that I thought was very interesting is kind of Europe is not Europe as we know it in this period. And so um, Dublin, obviously now is the capital of Ireland, but in, the, in that period it was a, a Viking kind of slave town. Um, 
And, and so I wanted the, the story to start in Dublin. So it starts in Dublin, midwinter, 1013. And I'll read from the beginning. Um, 1013, as you'll notice, was almost a thousand years ago. And um, if you think back to the Y2K um, kind of hysteria of the, you know, the world would end, our computers would crash, our digital watches would stop working, and how would we toast bread in the morning? Um, there was a similar kind of feeling um, in, uh, in Europe at this point as well, because it was a thousand years since Christ's birth. So Dublin, midwinter, 1013. Christ did not come again that year. The Lord kept his churches and the pages of his book, and Wolfnoth sat in the half-timbered hall, watching rain drip down through roof thatch, puddling on the floor while the peat fire smoked. His remaining men sat round him, the wooden benches drawn close, cloaks and hoods pulled tight to their chests, their round boss shields hung in the hall shadows, their spears were sheathed, their swords kept to hand like favorite hounds. The midwinter days were short and dark, thin shadows stretched long on the ground. No one spoke. It was bad business these days in Dublin. The slave markets were still busy, but day by day rumor grew of the size of Brian Borrow's war host. War was coming, like a mounted horseman. A blood-red horse, the Lord's Book said, hell and judgment following after. The seagulls sensed it, that distant scent of battle. They fought and cawed in chaotic multitudes, swooped low over small fishing boats, plucked cold, flapping fish from the slate-gray waters. The dull winter day was cold and gray and bleak. Wolfnoth stood at the quayside and looked out towards the estuary. He watched the masts of approaching warships appear among the riverside trees, the rain unceasing as it stripped the boughs, wet leaves plastered along the smooth river water. Wolfnoth shivered, despite his blue cloak and hood, the shaggy lining beginning to wear thin. The silver brooch held the wool cloth close to his chest, the disc patterned with three swirling hounds. The midwinter days were short, and the afternoon light was already beginning to fail. The hound's blue glass eyes were dull, one eye setting, blind and empty. Wolfnoth stood still as an ancient oak, gnarled and hollowed by too many winters, staring eastwards over the waves. His thoughts were far away from this muddy dockside, in the shadow of the high Dublin earthworks, topped with a wall of split timber. They crossed the grey and restless waves, made their way back to the fields of his youth, to his hall's hearthside, where warm and gentle hands welcomed his return, when there was good food on the table, when warm-hearted words and music and the laughter rose like Abbey Plain chant, when he slept without cares and the home rafters and a heavy thatch. So that's, that's the beginning of the story. Um, starts in Dublin, and Wolfnoth is actually the, the father of Godwin. Um, and, uh, and Godwin is the, the kind of hero of, his sto of this story, the father of the man who k gets killed at Battle of Hastings. Um, and what struck me, actually, in this period is, and one of the reasons I really wanted to, to kind of write a, a, you know, a series of books that try to kind of encompass it all, is that all the nations of Britain... Um, have very seminal figures in this period. In Ireland, um, you have Brian Borrow, who's the first man to unite the Irish kingdoms. Um, in Scotland, you have Macbeth, and the whole Shakespeare cast, you know, Kenneth Duncan, Macduff, Earl Seward. Um, in England, you have um, Ethelred Reddy, Canute, William the Conqueror, Howard Godwinson, all these names. Um, in Wales, you have um, some Llewellyn princes. And I thought, it seems to me that as the United Kingdom... Um, you know, carries on its kind of long um, fragmentation. That actually, how interesting to kind of, to cover this period of history when all the nations of Britain, the Scots, English, Welsh, and Irish, have, have kind of seminal figures in their history. And actually, one of the reasons that Harold loses at Hastings is because of Macbeth, um, which, you know, I thought was a fabulous story. And in, and in, and in Shakespeare, Earl Seward's a good Englishman, whereas actually he's a Norwegian <coughs> Viking who comes over with Canute, um, and so I guess all this stuff is, it seems really very relevant to Britain now um, and very interesting to kind of tease it out and see what is myth and what is the actual, I guess, closer to the truth. Can you talk a little bit about what 
it was like to live then? I mean, it's in the book. You talk about, you know, their manor houses and castles, but they wouldn't quite be recognizable as such. These are relatively yeah. small and humble. Um, we were talking about kind of archaeologically. I mean, if you're writing about the Romans, it's so much easier because not only is there more written material, but even archaeologically, um, there's far more stuff that survives because the Romans were using glass or they were using metal much more or their, their earthware pots were much better preserved. The Anglo-Saxons built houses out of wood um, and they, they used leather a lot and um, their pots kind of disintegrate. So it was quite difficult finding out the kind of the basics um, of, of the kind of the world they lived in. And one way of researching it is looking at their literature. Um, but the problem, I don't know how many people have read any Anglo-Saxon literature um, in translation, um, even. Their, I mean, their poems um, are what survive the most. And um, their poems are all, they're kind of, um, kind of religious poems. Um, and they're all about kind of midwinter, cold, snow, loneliness. Um, I mean, they're kind of, they're, they're all about the bad things in life, about the loss of warmth and the loss of heat. And I found it very tough, um, kind of trying to imagine their world, because I thought, I can't write a book where it happens in midwinter all year long. It's snowing all year, and, and people are miserable. Um, and I, I was actually, I was writing residence at Lingnan University. I was just kind of walking through the English department um, library, and I saw a book from the 1950s called The Lost Literature of Medieval England, um, and it was, it was printed in 1954, and the last time it had been taken out, I think it was in 1962. And, and I took the book out, and, um, and this was fabulous, because it was a, a book about books that we know existed, from, um, from catalogues of libraries, um, and it also had a lot of translations of, um, of Latin Old English texts. Because, I mean, English is quite interesting, because it's the probably the only country that has such a kind of a large body of native language literature um, to survive from the years of 500 onwards. Um, and what was interesting about the Latin texts is often they were, they were lives of saints or they were material about um, how saints came to the wilderness and, you know, kind of, and the crops grew and the, the chickens laid eggs and the pigs grew fat. Um, and so this was, this was fabulous because it gave me a completely different kind of view from their own sources kind of into their world and how they described, um, how they described the kind of the world they lived in and, and their kind of aspirations. So was, that was perfect because the Old English poems gave me midwinter and the religious texts gave me summer. Um, and then kind of archaeologically, there's all kinds of, you know, material. And I think one of the challenges of, of writing historical fiction is, um, or I think, I guess, good historical fiction, um, is to kind of to capture the world and to capture the, the, the kind of living conditions of the people. And you end up, um, I remember one, there was an excavation of um, a hearth, so kind of a cooking fire. And um, the excavators kind of had worked out from different um, material they found, kind of which straw they used for, um, for kindling, which straw they used for actually faggots for burning and cooking food. And of course, they would know the difference between barley straw or wheat straw or rye straw. Um, and so this, you end up kind of knowing this kind of detail, which actually, if you put into a book, would be so boring, um, it would be impossible to read. So you end up kind of learning this material and then never really using it. Or if you ever use it, it gets a kind of brief mention in the sentence, very obliquely. And you kind of, you know you've got rye straw as kindling, but no, you know, no one else will. Um, Wolf Noth and Godwin basically run southern England, isn't that? Yeah, so, so I mean, characters, again, um, there's a lot of kind of guesswork about this period. Um, the, the, <coughs> in England, we have this book called the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which is written by monks, so written by the church, and it's, it's basically a kind of religious um, chronicle of, of events that happen. And it's written after the events, maybe 20 or 30 years, so often they're kind of explaining um, why things happened. Um, so if a king is bad and ends up in getting killed in battle, they'll talk about you know, his mistresses or you know, how he, he stole money from the church and so then God punished him by killing him in battle. 
Um, and so a lot of the, the kind of the, the challenges for Shieldwall was kind of was fixing. We know certain people were at certain events and did certain things. And I guess the challenge for historical novelist is, is kind of creating the, the characters who do these things in real life um, and, and kind of moving them around and, and making, I think, I think where historical fiction has a real um, contribution to history um, is, is it views history through characters' points of view, often in a way history books don't. History books can often be about facts. Um, and I remember uh, reading a, a book called The Sun and Splendor by Sharon Penman, um, which is about the Wars of the Roses, um, so kind of Richard III and that period, just for the Tudors come to power. And I, I was very interested in this period as a, as, a, as a child, and it wasn't until I read this historical novel that I realized um, that I really didn't know the period at all, because if you didn't know Richard III was the, the cousin of Warwick the Kingmaker and that their relationships, you know, the relationships with their fathers, blah, 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 all their kind of family circumstances, how they grew up, what, you know, you really missed out on on um, the characters' motivations and who they were as people. And I thought, this is actually, this is where historical novels can do a great job. And this is actually where I had the first idea to kind of write historically. Um, entering stories that we know through history books, through the characters who were involved in those stories. And I think that gives you another kind of dimension onto the history. Yeah, I mean, I sort of knew most of the, the people. I learned about them in school. And... <clears throat> combined with the movies, you have these visions of people in gleaming armor and castles with flags flying. And it wasn't quite like that, was it? I mean, you, you, there, there are a couple scenes in Godwin's hall, which is burned down and they rebuild it. How big would it have been, really, compared to the size of this room, for example? Yeah, they, um, they kind of an, an average house clearly would be much smaller, but... Um, from excavations that archaeologists have done, they've, they've found um, Viking or uh, English halls probably about twice the length of this room. Um, really quite enormous um, buildings. Um, and, uh, you know, where I live in Yorkshire, in north of England, we still have, we have kind of traditional houses called Yorkshire longhouses, um, which I think are just kind of a continuation of, of Viking houses. So probably the kind of the width of this built, width, the width of this room, um, and one half would be where you kept your livestock, and the other half would be where the people lived. And so this was kind of the average dwelling, um, but kind of the king's halls were really, you know, quite substantial buildings. And also, um, they're also starting to build in stone um, again. So kind of, if you imagine a Viking city, actually you have a lot of Roman remains. Um, the kind of the last Roman buildings that we know mentioned um, in London, for example, are still around in the 1500s. So you'd have a kind of quite odd combination of Roman buildings still standing um, with kind of Viking wooden houses with thatched roofs kind of mixed in. Um, and so, you know, kind of very interesting kind of how it must have been for them, these people who didn't know how to build in stone. Um, sort of seeing these buildings. Um, and then, of course, churches. I mean, we have surprised... I mean, actually, having written the book, I was surprised how many places you can still go back and walk in the footsteps of people. So I was back in England last month, and there's a place called Bosham on the um, Solent on the south coast of England with a church that was built by Godwin. Um, and uh, I, I found that many of these places, these churches, um, are still in England. Um, and so this, this was kind of quite exciting for me, yeah. Um, being here and kind of um, thinking, actually, you can go to England and you can walk in the places where these kings walked. Because um, for English people, this, the, the pre-Norman period is a semi-mythical past. You know, we date our kings from William the Conqueror. So we have, you know, William the I, um, Edward I, who comes, you know, a couple of generations after him. He's actually about Edward VII because there's been so many Anglo-Saxon kings. But the Normans did such a kind of brain job um, on the English that we, we just forget all these Anglo-Saxon kings and Anglo-Saxon history. Uh, so it was quite amazing for me as an Englishman to kind of think, oh, wow, you know, there, there are places, these, the buildings that these men built that you can still go back and walk you know, in the exact same footsteps, which seems quite magical to me. Um, sorry, I... I That's all, you know, you know I, I um, reading the book, I started to 
look up on Wikipedia, you know, some of like Svein Forkbeard, which is a great name. He was king for about six months or something like yeah. that. And uh, so this either means, and it, and it agreed with the book, which either means that the book's correct, or it means you used Wikipedia when you were writing the book, or it means that you edited Wikipedia after you wrote the book. So it would agree yeah, with what you agree, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, Wikipedia, Wikipedia is a great kind of, you know, entrance in. Um, but really, there's so, I mean, you know, I wrote this book in Hong Kong, um, and it's about Dark Age England, and it was about places in England I've never been to. And uh, funnily, I was being interviewed by Discovery Bay magazine, um, and uh, the guy interviewed me saying, oh, is, at the end, we had like a two-hour chat, and at the end he said, oh, is this, is a village that takes place, Compton, in West Sussex? And I said, yeah, it's next to Up Marsden and Down Marsden. And I said, oh, my lesbian aunt lives in Compton. <laughs> and I said, oh, really? And he said, yes. He said, oh, you got the village very right. And I said, I'm so glad you said that, because I've never been. But I use Google Earth, and I use Google Earth um, to, to kind of to trace, you know, if I was having a character walk from one village to the next, you can trace on Google Earth the paths and it tells you to the foot the altitude of where you're walking. So I knew if characters were walking uphill or downhill, and I knew if you were kind of looking out from a building, you were looking over a, a slope going downwards, or, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, it was fabulous. And, and yeah, Wikipedia is a help. Um, but there's, I mean, I guess so much more is the kind of archaeological information that you can find now. Um, so many journals are online, you know, all these PDFs I could download and read. Um, so actually, yeah, I, I don't think I could have written the book in the way I did from Hong Kong um, without the internet, um, and certainly without Google Earth. So thank you, Google. Um, how much is true? How much do you know is true? How much is true enough or illuminatingly true? What, what it, when you write historical fiction, how much of it, or put it another way, what what can one learn from reading historical fiction that you don't get from just reading history? And how true is that? Yeah, I think this is, um, this is an interesting question of, um, you know, historical fiction is not um, a historical, you know, kind of textbook. You wouldn't pass an exam necessarily, you know, reading, um, you know, Shield Wall. But, um, and I think this is, this is kind of, the novelist's question is, how close to the facts do you keep? And I, I've, I've read a, a book by Bernard Cornwell, um, who you know, is, is a very well-known historical novelist. And at, one of, at the back of one of his books, he said, you know, um, you know, I keep to the facts, apart from this battle happened in a different year, but I wanted my character to be at both battles, so I moved it. And that kind of, that, that spoiled the book for me. You know, I thought, oh, I kind of, I feel, you know, I, I didn't like that. And so uh, I think... Often writers, you're, you're writing the book for yourself. You, you know, you are the first audience. You know, you have to get up every morning and, you know, not watch TV or not talk to your wife or not talk to the children and sit alone in a room and write a book. And so if you're not enjoying it, if you're not interested, um, then you can't, almost can't expect the audience, to, you know, the, the reader to be. Um, and so I, I always, I really set myself the kind of task of, of writing as close to history as possible. Um, which makes, you know, which makes it a bit difficult, especially with this period. There, you know, so I was talking a bit earlier. Most of the main characters are real people, um, and we know, when they, we know when they died. We can guess when they were born from the ages they get married or, or this kind of thing, or the, the ages their names start to be recorded. But a lot of stuff we don't know. We don't know why people did things often. Um, and so this, this book... Um, I think is quite close to the truth um, because you can bring a knowledge of a period um, and and make guesses at why people did things. You know, thinking about their their kind of their law codes, their honor codes, their family relationships. Um, and there was a book by um, a fabulous historian from York um, who died. You know, a guy called Richard Fletcher, um, Blood Feud, where he, he was he was bringing kind of a historian's knowledge to kind of. This, this story of a blood feud from this period. Um, and it was, it was kind of like a detective story because, you know, people's names would pop up in various sources and people would kill another person and, and kind of vice versa. And, 
he was trying to work out what the story was. And it really is kind of detective work. Um, and so I was, I was basing my, you know, kind of my research on people like him who bring a, a very kind of close knowledge of the period um, and the, the kind of the, the society. And, um, you know, if because England had quite a sophisticated law system at this period, but um, you also had the blood feud. So if someone killed your brother, you could go and then kill them. And then, of course, their family would kill you because you killed them, you know, um, it gets, you know, it kind of goes on like this. So all this kind of stuff you can bring to the period and work out what is true. But the, the basic facts, you know, the people... Um, I guess the people, the events are all true, and, and as a novelist, you try and um, shed light on the characters and why they did things, and why you know why their stories can end up as they are. Because there's the, one of, one of the other characters is King Ethelred, who has this unfortunate nickname, I suppose it is, Ethelred the Unready, which is how I knew of him. Yeah, I'm, and, I'm, and and. He, he dithered, apparently, for decades about what to do about the Vikings and ended up basically losing the whole country, didn't they? Yeah, there's, I mean, they have fabulous nicknames from this period. They didn't kind of call their kings first or second. They often called them by nicknames. And so you have Ethelred the Unready. You have Spain Forkbeard. Um, another one, great one is Ralph the Timid, um, which is a great kind of, you know... Um, comment on his, uh, his kind of warlikeness. So Ethelred the Unready is kind of one of the worst kings in English history. Um, and there was a movement recently for historians to kind of resurrect him and say he wasn't so bad. Um, but actually, I think kind of the events in this story, his son um, takes over. His son, so his father's Ed, Ethelred the Unready. His son is called Edmund Ironside. So even from the kind of the two nicknames, you know that there's a real difference between these two characters. Um, and so... Um, yeah, sorry, uh, um, I was going off on, on <laughs> nicknames, yeah. Um. I think we'll, we'll open it up for questions in a minute, but maybe read, it, read a bit more and uh, yeah, give I, people another bit of flavor of the thing. Something I really wanted to bring into the language, you know, I've, uh, my earlier books really have been about China, and I, I've, speaking some Mandarin Chinese, I really wanted to bring the kind of the, not just, I mean, language has its kind of rhythms and everything else, but I also wanted to kind of to bring the, the mindset of, of Chinese into my English, um, and I, you know, I was I was delighted when a few reviewers, including um, some you know native Chinese speaker reviewers, said it, it felt like the book had been translated from Chinese into English, which I thought was one of the best compliments. Um, and so with this book, I wanted to do something quite similar, um, and so I really want to kind of bring um, the rhythms of old English um, into into my English, my modern English. Um, and uh, I'm going to read a bit, a bit from much later on in the book. I mean, this is, um, this is quite different for me. It's, it's, there's a lot more action in this book. I mean, you have, a, you have six battles happen in the, in the space of a year. And, um, and this is actually the last one, um, where Godwin, who's the son of Wolfnoth, um, has become a, a kind of veteran. And so he's moved from the, the back lines of the battle to kind of the front line. And this is him um, going into battle for the last time. Godwin did not like the long wait, no more than he had when he was a defender. Come on, let's get this bastard battle over with, he thought to himself. But Edmund paused for the monks to sing a psalm, the one they had sung when Godwin was a boy. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. When the singing was over, Godwin stood at the front of the English and looked up at the Danes who took the crest of the low slopes. They were tall and well-dressed and did not look afraid. They looked eager for battle. The sight was sobering. Do not parry with the sword. Sword on sword will ruin a blade. Do not watch the enemy's blade. Watch his body and wait for an opening. Godwin needed to piss again, but there was no time. He took his place at the front of the line, and they moved forward, and Godwin felt the field slope upwards. The army waited, a line of painted shields quartered with red and white, blue and green, black and yellow. Some were decorated with crosses, the, boss, the bosses gleamed, the edges of axes and spears and swords had been freshly wetted. They gleamed with a cold white light. The Danes were silent till Edmund dressed the English lines one final time and then led them forward at a slow walking pace. 
the army winded their war horns, hurled smooth, round estuary stones, and roared their war cries. The English replied enthusiastically. By the horns of hell, Godwin thought, as Edmund led them forward into the hail of deadly darts. Hell, 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 he thought, as each step brought the Danes closer. He could now make out faces amongst the mass of shields and lined himself up. When they were three spear lengths apart, Godwin could smell the sweat and the fear, and he could see the features that made each Dane distinctive from the next. When he was clear which man he would face, Godwin's mouth went dry. Christ help me, Godwin thought, and felt the sweat on his spear shaft as the distance between them closed to less than a single furlong. That's one big, ugly bastard. How good's your Anglo-Saxon? Um, not bad. See, I, I, I pulled up the Lord's Prayer in Anglo-Saxon. Oh, okay. can, can you read the first line? It's probably, your pronunciation is probably better than Yeah, mine. let me give it a go. So, I, um, this, is, this is what the English of the time actually sounded like. Father o ve ve yatun hiofenum, si thin nama ge halgud, to become a thin neriche, ge worth a thin willa, and you often swa swa on hiofenum. Um, I can do. On. Yeah. yeah. But you know that you can you can get little bits of that might be English, but yeah, it, get, it kind of sends a bit of a shiver down my spine when I hear people speaking old English, because it's it's something that you can it feels that you almost should be able to understand it, um, and uh, it kind of wavers on the edge of being understood, and I I, I love that kind of feeling, but it's really um, different still. Yeah, very different. Um, although once you start to work out just some of the basic rules of how English changed between Old English and Middle English, or Modern English, um, then you can, it, it becomes much more transparent, honest. Um. I think we'll, um, so we'll, we'll open it up for questions from the floor, if you have any. We have about another half hour or so, I think. Before the Vikings break through the roof. That's right. Well, while people are thinking of them, well, you're talking about research. There was something I, I read on the BBC, I think just yesterday, or Scientific American. Uh, they were studying armor. They dressed some poor people up in a full suit of armor and put them on a treadmill to see how they would do it. The, the, the conclusion was it's really tiring. Yeah. Um, but the, the, one th the one sort of thing they learned, which might have helped inform your book, is that apparently you had to breathe shallow and fast. Yeah, but this was Sorry. about the Battle of Agincourt, wasn't it? Oh, I don't know. I think they just dressed people up in full suits of armor and put them in the gym. And see yeah, well, I was, I was listening to the same piece. They were talking about yeah. Agincourt, where, where they wore kind of full armor from head to toe. And actually saying that actually modern soldiers carry a similar weight, but um, it's kind of on their back, which makes it much easier to carry. Um, and the, kind of the, the effort of swinging your legs when your legs weigh an extra 10 kilos each um, can be quite exhausting. Um, yeah, so there was all that, you know. Um, I have a friend in Discovery Bay whose son is into reenactment groups. So these are groups in England who dress up um, in kind of Viking armor or Roman armor, and they do kind of battles. They go to old battle sites and kind of act out the battles. Um, and uh, he was very keen for me to go and join his um, reenactment group in England. Um, Bec and, you know, I was quite tempted, but I didn't, I didn't manage to get the time. But I think it's fascinating to see kind of how much, you know, um, chainmail armor would weigh or, and then to go and fight, um, you know, for hours, um, you know, in battle. You know, quite extraordinary. But I think there was a study on, because people have lived much more physical lives, I think um, someone worked out that a, an average Viking would need about 5,000 calories a day because he's chopping wood, he's, you know, um, killing sheep, skinning sheep, you know, carrying water, all this kind of stuff. Pillaging and sacking. Pillaging, you know, all that. Um, you know, I, I love, and this, this is, again, is something I, I find fascinating, is um, I get, I don't know how many people get seasick, but um, I get seasick the minute I look at water. And, um, you know, thinking about um, kind of Vikings who sail over from Norway across the North Sea, um, no wonder they were in such a bad mood, um, because these ships are open, cold, 
um, places. And just, you know, the thought of being seasick for three days straight in the North Sea with kind of, you know, the, the cold wind blowing, um, you know, kind of no wonder they were very aggressive. Anyway. Yeah. You, if you, here's a question here. Sorry, I got a sore throat. Uh, my voice is very low today, so I apologize. And uh, I would like to have a question, because now today's topic is talking about history. So uh, I would like to ask you, do you think your fiction is popular among teenagers? Do they like to read historical fictions? And do you think that historical fictions, if, they, if a teenager read more about his, more historical fictions, they will have more understanding about more understanding about history, and also they will have more interest to learn more about history to encourage them to have a, to have a, yeah, to have a interest to uh, understand history and yeah, and having at least a better histo- historical knowledge. Yeah. You know, I, I, that's a great question. I think so, and I hope so. And certainly, from my experience, um, you know, when I was a teenager, I was reading, you know, kind of Alfred Duggan and Rosemary Sutcliffe um, um, and, and finding out about history through these stories, you know, as well as kind of television. Yeah, and it's, it's funny you ask about teenagers, because something I've never really believed in is kind of teen fiction. Um, because when I was a teenager, the last thing I wanted to watch, read was teen fiction. I wanted to read real fiction. I wanted to read the stuff my dad was reading. Um, and so, you know, I hope so. And I know from, from my, you know, experience, you know, I was fascinated by Vikings and, you know, this kind of period as a youth. And I read, you know, uh, Henry Treese, um, all these kinds of books. And I, I would be delighted um, if, you know, if my books kind of gave someone else an enthusiasm um, for this period. And it's quite interesting as a writer, um, I, I kind of I used to joke about when you're write, when you're being a writer, um, you know, do you write about say sex or swear words? You know, do you put them in? And I used to joke about the my mother is going to read this syndrome, um, which kind of you know terrifies a lot of writers. You know, thinking my mother's going to read this. You know, what can I, I can I tell the truth or not? Um, and actually, I, I'd kind of got past that. But then I saw my son who had just gone to school, and I thought. Oh no, I now have, my son is going to read this syndrome. And so actually, I went through it and I, I took all the sex out. Um, there wasn't much sex anyway, but I took it out. And, um, there wasn't much sex in the book or in the Anglo Saxon period? Yeah, well, in the, it must have been the Anglo Saxon period. But yeah, in the book, all the, all the sex went. And I took out all the swear words because um, I thought, you know, I can't have my son reading a book I've written with swear words in it. But um, this is a lot. Almost comic books or movies. There's a movie just about Thor just came out, isn't it? Yeah. And this is all, essentially, he's in there, isn't he? And this is, this is the stuff teenagers like to go to the movies and watch, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, you know, teenagers, it, I say this is kind of action book. Um, I mean, the book used to, you know, has been much longer, um, but it just, I had to kind of cut it back. And so it's, it's ended up, what I hope is quite a, a, quite a, quite a fast read. Um, and, uh, and I think that, you know, is, is probably good for teens, um, in that, it, you know, the pace of the story, um, I hope it's a page turner. Um, and so I think that, that's a, a kind of a good thing. Yeah. yeah lot, lots of swords and battle axes and yeah. that sorts of things. I mean, battles, you know, I remember watching Avatar, the film, and thinking, you know, it's, it's great to kill all your characters in the last battle, um, or kind of frighten the reader. Um, because it makes, you know, I know, as a, I know from books I really enjoy reading, um, you know, uh, it's kind of when you fear for your characters, they're going into a, a situation and you're, you're nervous for them. And uh, hopefully in this, this book, you know, you, you kind of, you feel for Godwin um, and the other characters in the story. Um, and it makes for kind of a very exciting book, I think. I'm going to ask, ask another question. If you have a question, raise your hand, and I'll just keep on it. There's one there. Otherwise, I'll just keep on asking questions. I've got a whole page full of them. And I get to go first. But, so if you don't raise your hand, you won't get a chance. Has any of your books been optioned to be made into films? And if the answer is yes, what will be your first concern? Um, no. Um, the Drink and Dream Tea House, my novel that was set in, in modern China, 
um, had a lot of people interested in, and, you know, from working titles as a big British company um, to um, the U.S. films, you know, studios were looking... We're looking to do a Chinese language film, and this was about six years ago. So no one optioned it in the end. Um, but I hope, you know, um, we live in a very kind of strange world, actually, where um, best-selling books often decided by you know, which ones are made into films or not. Um, and, you know, as I think this is a great book and I want it to sell, you know, obviously I want it to be made into a film. Um, but I think... Um, I think when you, you sell a, a book as a film, you, you kind of, you give up, um, you give up, it's no longer your, it's kind of, it's not your project. Like, I don't know how to tell a story in film. I know how to tell a story in words on a page. Um, and so, I guess you just hope that they, you know, if it happens, then they put together a good team um, to make it into a good film. You know, I think, you know, one of the best adaptations I remember is The English Patient, where I, I thought actually the f I, I thought the film was better than the book in many ways, um, and I think you know I, I would hope you know that something like that happens um, that actually they, they they do something interesting with it, and actually that might mean straying from the story or changing the story slightly um, because you are telling it in a very different medium. Um, and I think it's interesting how I I, I really feel you know I I've, I've been published now. Um, about 15 years and I think the publishing industry has changed quite a lot and I think one of the big influences on the way we read and write stories is television and film um, I think it has really changed the way um, people think um, and expect a story or how long they will give a story before they think oh, this is boring, I'm going to put it down um, and, you know, I, I hear this a lot in the publishing houses um, and, uh, you know, I don't know if it's a good change or not a good change, but, um, you know, it's a challenge for a writer to kind of to write books that um, people will, will, you know, I want you to put down a book and say, you know, hand it to the person next to you and say, this is fabulous, you've got to read it. Um, and so I think that's, that's kind of a challenge now. Um, um, Kindles, what's your view on... Uh paper books versus electronic books? Yeah, um, you know, I, I dismissed Kindles until about a year ago when um, at the City University of Hong Kong we have an MFA in creative writing and lots of our students turned up with Kindles and e-books and iPads and, and I suddenly saw, wow, actually they do look great, you know, um, you can read off them. Um, and some people, you know, people kind of always bemoan um, change. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not a bemoaner. Um, I kind of think, well, you know, deal with it. Um, and, you know, when, when television came, people said that's the end of radio. And we still have radio. Um, and so I think, I think it's, a, it's, it's definitely a change. And I think the publishing industry is going to change quite a lot in the next few years. Um, but I think it's also an opportunity because um, the publishing industry is kind of quite a stranglehold on what gets published. So um, new books we published, books that maybe wouldn't be e economic as printed books will get published as e-books. Um, you know, for, for me as a writer, it's a great way to get my kind of my backlist into print um, because it's very easy to kind of have it as a download. And I think, I think what is going to happen um, is probably it's gonna, the e-book is going to replace mass market paperbacks to some extent. I don't think it's going to replace hardbacks. I still think people are going to want books in their, their rooms, you know, in their living space. You know, when I walk into a house and there's no books, I feel there's something missing. And, you know, I love walking in someone's house and looking at their bookshelves and, and just kind of just seeing what they, they can display about themselves. And I love books as objects um, as well. So I think, you know, it's, it's definitely going to change um, publishing. But I think... There's a lot of opportunities for writers, actually. Um, and being able to self-publish, I have things that I would love to make books out of, but I would never get published through the conventional media, whereas now there's lots of ways of getting small books or kind of chat books that I think would be very interesting and fun for me to write um, and get them published either as e-books or as kind of print-on-demand, which is also the big change that's happening. In front here. Is there a microphone coming up front here? At the front. At the front. 
Yeah, Mr. Hill, um, when you're writing a chapter about a specific uh, historical background um, or scenery, um, do you check or searching the um, accuracy of the uh, actual fact, or are you using your imagination for that part? Thank you. Um, so I start off always with checking the, ac you know, the, the actual place. Um, you know, it, I mean, this book has taken me five years to write, um, and I spent the first year just doing solid research. And the reason it took me so long is I kept realizing there's stuff I didn't know that I needed to know, which could be, you know, what kind of buttons they use. You know, um, what if you walked into a room? You know, what would the room look like? What would you sit down upon? If there was a table, you know, what would be on the table? Um, what kind of personal objects would you have in your pocket? Um, you know, the idea of what would you sit down upon? Would you sit on a bench or a stool or a chair? And actually, chairs were very high status symbols. So, um, an incredible amount of, of checking details. Um, and, uh, and then a kind of, you know, of, of working out, does that actually need to be in the story? Um, is that important? Because actually the story, because I'm not writing an encyclopedia of Anglo-Saxon England. I'm writing a story, and the story is through a character's point of view, and it's through Godwin's point of view. So actually, um, you know, if you were at a demonstration or, you know, at some kind of big event, you might not see everything that's happening. Um, and so I, I, you just see your kind of point of view. Um, and so I, I was thinking, okay, this is everything is happening, or this is what the place looks like, but actually, what would the character experience? And I think um, this, is, this is the difference with historical fiction, is that you, you're approaching a story through a character's point of view, and through their eyes, and through their experience. And so, um, it's a, a combination of imagination, and, and you know, lots and lots of research. Is it easier to write, because we don't know that much about Godwin, really. You know much more about some of the other people. Queen Emma or Ethelred. Is it easier to write about a character f for whom actually less is known, or is it easier to write about someone about more, about more is known? Um, I think it's easier to write about someone um, that we know less about. And actually, it's more exciting that way um, because it gives you more opportunity, um, gives you more freedom, more opportunity to kind of to make that character up. I mean, um, because again, I was talking about kind of the experience of writing is that, you know, you spend hours, you know, I spent five years with Godwin, um, and I really like him as a character. I think, you know, quite extraordinary kind of events he lived through. Um, and I, you know, I miss, you know, I've started the next book now, and I miss not writing about Godwin. Um, and that's, that's partly because I could, I could really kind of make him up and use my experiences. You know, he, he grows up in an England that's in what appears to be terminal decline, you know, um, an England where there's, um, Vikings are invading every few years and, you know, they're burning houses, they're stealing money, they're killing cattle. Um, and so, you know, actually that reminded me quite a lot of growing up in Yorkshire, um, you know, during the, the, the 80s in England where Yorkshire was kind of in terminal decline. The steel works were closing, the coal mines were closing, all the kind of the great things about Yorkshire industry were closing. And so all that kind of stuff, I can bring my own experiences and memories into, into Godwin as a character. Question here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hill. Um, uh, two, actually, two questions. Uh, the first question is, um, obviously, what you're writing in some sort of so-called, well, maybe non-fictional novel, you have sort of a really referring to some true historical events. And then um, you have got... A, this genre, you've got, I mean, I've read, um, what is it, The Wolf Hole by Hilary Mantle. Yeah. And then you've got the other type of books which are purported to be um, true historical accounts like biographies, say, for example. And then in your case, you could actually dream up some dialogues. But in those, what we may call real biographies or whatever, they have some of those things also got fairly sort of, sort of uh, vivid dialogue, so to speak, in quotation marks. Mm. So um, is there sort of um, difference so from your point of view, or maybe it's not fair to you, that those historians, between you and those historians, so to speak. And then the other question is to follow on from about, about your observations about the use of swear words. 
Now, I see that those middle market newspapers like Daily Mail or even The Sun, when they have the F word, they use F star, star, star. But in truly upmarket publications, posh ones like Financial Times, they actually print F U C K. Um, um, in full, I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I'm just a bit, is it, is it just uh, those Daily Mail or those the sun like petite bourgeois, while the, um, those truly upmarket publications, I mean, they don't give a damn about it. Thank you. Um, you know, I don't know about the newspapers, um, but, uh, you know, the idea of, of histories, um, or the kind of the difference between historical fiction and biography and things. Um, you know, I think one of the differences is what you expect from a book. And obviously with a biography, you're expecting something quite different than if you're reading historical fiction. Um, and uh, again, quite different if you're reading, you know, kind of historical, um, you know, uh, his historical kind of novelized fiction, I mean, history. Um, I, mean, I think it's quite interesting. I think people are playing with the genres much more now. Um, like Humphrey Carpenter, um, he was one of the first biographers to kind of fictionalize days. You know, he would kind of say, let's imagine a day in the life of this character. And, you know, he would kind of make it all up, which uh, at that point, you know, kind of the 80s, people thought was dreadful that you would make stuff up in a biography. But actually, you know, I found as a writer, you know, my first books were, you know, my first book was was true to the point of, you know, um, it all happened exactly as I reported it. But actually, I found moving from non-fiction, creative non-fiction, into fiction, actually with fiction in many ways, you can get much closer to the truth than you can um, in writing non-fiction. Um, that's quite, uh, I can go on about that at length, but I won't, um, unless anyone asks me to. <laughs> there we go. Um, so I, I'll tell you, I'll make it very brief. When I went to China, I went to mainland China, small town China in 93, and um, the books, I, I read all the books I could find, and there was about five of them. Um, and there was still a kind of very prevalent idea of kind of the Chinese being inscrutable. And, um, you know, I went to China, and I didn't find people at all inscrutable. In fact, I find them very easy to understand. Um, and once you kind of learnt Chinese culture and customs and language, very straightforward. And I thought someone has to write a better book about China than the, than the ones I'd read. And so I, I tried to write a book about the town I lived in, and it was all true and um, you know, kind of accurate and everything. But I found the very odd thing with travel writing, and this is kind of a problem with travel writing, is that it turns the locals into foreigners. Um, because I'm, I'm an Englishman in China reporting everything I see and, and kind of things I think are interesting. And so all the Chinese people become foreigners in their own country. Um, and they're, they're kind of reduced to kind of romantic or pathetic or heroic characters. And I thought, it really irritated me. And I thought, this book has not done what I wanted it to do. So then the next book I wrote about China, I wrote um, a novel, The Drink and Dream Tea House. And um, still, Western writers, when they write about China, they always put a Western character in the novel as if you can't understand China or the Chinese unless you have a Westerner holding your hand doing that same thing of turning all the Chinese into foreigners. And that really irritated me. And I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to write a book about Xiaoyang in Hunan province and there's going to be no Westerners and you'll, ne you'll never see a Westerner. People won't talk about Westerners because this is a book about China and kind of modern China and what's happening um, in China. And so in that way, the whole kind of idea of inscrutability becomes a non-issue because you're in the head of the Chinese characters and you're understanding, and this is why I talked about kind of writing it, um, trying to bring kind of the Chinese way of seeing the world and interacting with each other um, into the English of you're your, your in the heads of Chinese characters who are talking to each other kind of in Chinese. Um, and so you're immediately, you, for a Western reader, you're immediately kind of in China in a way that non-fiction couldn't bring you. And that, that's what's the magical things about fiction is it, it brings you into the character, it brings you into the experience in a much more um, in, immediate way than kind of non-fiction writing. Um, there you go. That was pretty good. Yeah. A couple of minutes. Yeah, there you go. Good. I hope that makes sense. Question at the back. Uh, 
Mr. Hill. Um, this question, hopefully, it's a fair one to address with you. Um, as a person who's a writer who's been uh, writing about uh, um, bringing history into life and um, almost bringing characters in the past like Godwin to life, um, what do you think of a, uh, an author's responsibility to um, address which parts of the uh, novel may be creative and which parts may be taking certain license and other parts that are non-fictional? Um, I use two examples so you see where I'm coming from. One would be Mary Beard's um, book about uh, Pompeii, mm -hmm. which is a claim for its uh, factual substance. The other end would be something that I enjoyed very much, but uh, I had my doubts about something like the Da Vinci Code, for example. It has a disclaimer in the front that says most of these things, if not all of these things, are true. So I don't know which ones are not, so if you could. You know, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And I, I approach it, what would I like as a reader? And I like, as a reader, at the end of the book, um, not before the book, because I don't want to spoil the experience of, you know, kind of reading it. Um, at the end of the book, to kind of know which bits are true and which bits are not true, like which characters are real, which ones are not real, um, and kind of um, what um, has, you know, what, what bits are real, made up, etc., cetera, um, and which bits are guesswork, which bits are kind of intuition. And so, um, you know, as a writer, um, you know, at the end of the book, I have a, a, a kind of a fairly brief author's note that kind of covers some of the basics, really. I mean, you know, I could, I could probably write almost as long a book about, you know, the whole process of, you know, which bits are true and not true and which bits are, are imagined or not. But just kind of basically setting out, almost as a teaser for the reader, because I think, again, where historical fiction is fabulous is that you end, might end a book like this, having really enjoyed it, and be teased by the author's notes saying, you know, these people are real, these events are real, other bits I made up, and I made them up like this because of, you know, whatever it, reason. Um, and then that's a, a, a springboard, really, um, to then go and find out the real history. You know, to pick up a history book, um, and then go and, you know, find out for yourself, um, having been inspired and excited by history. You know, I, you know, um, I think history is incredibly interesting, and um, you know, all kinds of great stories. You know, no wonder. You know, writers like Shakespeare, you know, even in Chinese classics, we, we didn't really talk about the Chinese, but, you know, the kind of romance, the three, three kingdoms, you know, all, all kinds of, you know, people tell their, you've, we fix ourselves in the modern world, often through the, the, the history or the myths we tell ourselves about kind of, you know, our country or our families. Um, and so history, I think, is incredibly important um, of defining and redefining ourselves, you know, in the modern world. Um, and probably more now than ever because so much is changing in the world around us. Um. You, you brought up Shakespeare. Yeah. Sometimes our views of Cleopatra, for example, actually come from Shakespeare. It wasn't, it wasn't really very accurate at all. Yeah. Um, I mean, there, I mean is, there is that danger, isn't there, that, I that think people can become fixated on the fictional uh, yeah. version of of reality rather than the real version. Of you know, Shakespeare probably wouldn't do very well now um, on historical accuracy. Um, you know, uh, reviewers would, would go to town on Shakespeare um, as being a kind of sycophantic, um, you know, writer. So I think now is almost, kind of, you know, quite interesting kind of golden age because there are so many writers, I think, who are trying to, we know so much more. Um, we have more access to material and sources. And a lot of writers who are trying to keep very close to the truth um, as well as writing very good stories. Time for one or two more questions. Are there more? There's one here. So, excuse me, uh, can I follow up the previous questions? You have talked about that you do not like to, I mean, you've, uh, you have said that you think uh, to write about stories that less people know, write about something that we are not very familiar with, it is better, it's more exciting. But uh, as you know that the student, the situation of students learning history in Hong Kong is awful, we can say. They don't like history, they hate history and just want to get a textbook and then finishing the exam just throw away. I, th I think that's not so, just true in Hong Kong. I yeah, think it's uh, a problem with yeah. students around the world. Yeah, so, uh, so have you, do you have an idea of writing about something which is more common like Asian romance? like Asian Greek, which can, uh, just like you have said, that uh, the historical fiction actually can help students to learn history. So would you have an idea to like to write about more common history like the World Wars, which can 
I think students will be more interested in those stories, and I think it will help them learning history more. So do which, you have this idea? Which bits of history are you studying, and which ones are the most boring? <laughs> uh, I would say it is about the Dark Ages, and also about the ancient times, since very less information. Okay. Um, ancient times, there's actually there's lots of books. Um, and Romans, it's funny, someone said to me, do you think they'll make a film out of this? And I said, you know what? Um, the Anglo-Saxons are not very cool. You know, they have moustaches, um, for one thing. And you can't dress them, you know, kind of like 300. You know, you can't show their legs off. You know, um, you can't kind of, they don't wear sexy clothing. They wore trousers and cloaks and they had long hair and moustaches. Um, you know, they're, kind of, they're much too hairy. You can't kind of do a 300 on them and, you know, pecs and abs and everything. Um, so the, I think the classical, there's actually there's lots of writers, you know, in the kind of classical period and um, dark ages. Well, you know, this might, you know, enliven the dark ages a little bit. Um, yeah. But uh, I think was, I guess, um, for me, writing about the history, I, I like periods that, um, or, or stories that no one really knows about. I think that's quite exciting. Um, and uh, I, and um, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, I can't remember now. Never mind. Leading on for that, um, from that, um, I've read that this is part of a trilogy, yeah. and you know the book's got fabulous reviews. So could you share a little bit about what you're planning to, uh, to write about in the next two? Yeah, the next um, two. The next one is um, Godwin's son. It's his story. Um, and so it's Harold. It's the guy who gets the arrow in his eye. It's Harold Godwinson. Um, it's his story. Um, you know, I said a trilogy, partly because I was very inspired by Lord of the Rings and um, to kind of start writing in the first place. And so well, I, you know, I thought this would be my homage to Tolkien. Um, and it's, it's changed, you know, vastly um, since then. Um, probably for the best, actually. But uh, actually, I could, see, I could see five books quite easily about this period. Um, about very inch and each telling um, one character's view of one character's story, um, and often I don't know if anyone's read the Alexandria Quartet by Alexander Durrell. Uh, just a fabulous um, books, and they're they're four books that cover the same period of um, Alexandria, kind of in the 1930s and the Second World War, and each one is is you know, Justin, Chloe, Balthazar, and I can't remember the last one. And they're all the same events told from different characters' points of view. And I've always thought that is fabulous. I would love to do that or something like that. And I had thought about doing it about this town in Xiaoyang in Hunan that I've, I've written about. Um, but actually, I think maybe this would be quite a good way of, of doing that, of, of approaching this period from different characters' points of view um, and telling their story. Um, and uh, I think that would be, you know, so I could see actually five books, but we'll see how successful, how many people, how long I stay excited by it and how long the readers stay excited by it to see how many books I'll write. Um, because I'm starting, you know, I'm starting to get a Hong Kong, ideas for Hong Kong. Um, I don't know if Timothy Mo um, has kind of famously said, you know, Hong Kong is the graveyard for English novelists. Um, <laughs> Which I think, okay, that's a challenge. I, you know, um, you know, I don't think there's been a, a really good kind of English writer writes about Hong Kong yet. So, um, you know, I like a challenge. So maybe um, I'll write about Hong Kong in the future. You have a lot of history to get through first, don't you? Yeah, yeah. maybe. You know. <laughs> <laughs> there are books that can find, so we'll leave some time for that now. Um, please join me in thanking Justin for coming all the way from Discovery Bay. Thank you. Thank you.